All right, Kay, we are live, so you can see if you can find it and get it sent. That would be great. Uh, there is a chance that Africa will be watching today. So, hopefully that is working. Things are, screen is tipped too far. Hold on a sec. I was the headless preacher for a bit. <laughs> so, all right, so, couple of things. First of all, I want you to grab your Bibles, open to Matthew 19, verses 16 through 30. When you're there, let me know. Matthew 19, 16 through 30. There. You're there? You're there? You're working on it? All right. So, put your finger in it. All right. Now... I want you to, how many of you have a pen so you can take notes? Yeah. All right, I want you to write down Deuteronomy chapter 8, because I'm going to give you homework, and you're going to have to read that later. Okay, my screen is not working. All right, let me, Rondo, shut your app off for me if you would. online, guess what? You get a minute reprieve so that I can figure out the technology. All right, guys. Well, if we don't have technology, we don't have technology, and it won't matter because I have what I need, and you get to listen. So that's the most important part, right? Mm -hmm. um, you got a Bible in your hands, and it looks like we're still streaming live, so we're okay there. Um, the one thing you won't have is the scripture verses up on the screen, um, and I have a bunch today, so I'm not expecting you to follow me through the whole process. But on the other side of that, um, today's going to be a good day. Uh, it, it, it is going to be a really good message, and I am guessing it's going to break you. That's my hope, okay? Because it broke me in a really good way. Um, and so when... Uh, we get going on this, again, Matthew 19, 16 through 30 is where we're going to be reading out of today. And then Deuteronomy chapter 8 is your homework. 
all right? We're going to talk about it a little bit, but I didn't reference. There's so much in it that I wanted to reference that it would have taken up pages and pages and pages. Got that all back up and running? All right, give me a second. I will get us on the right screen. All right. <coughs> We're there. All right. So, Matthew 19, 16 through 30. Today, our message is entitled, Then Come and Follow Me. The scripture verses that we're looking at are in, we're looking at it from Matthew, but it is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is the verses that I thought I was going to preach last week. But when I was reading it in context, God made me share last week's message from the verses that preceded it. So last week's message leads into this week, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Matthew 19, 16 through 30. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. <coughs> Jesus replied, replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then shall be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left house, or brother, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. That many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Last week we discussed coming to God like a child would. And I said that much of the attitude of coming to an authority figure, a teacher, is that a child looks at that authority in their life with a sense of awe. Awe is that state of reverence but it's also a state of, in a sense of fear, not necessarily of the person, like if you were being afraid of being punished from rage, but more as the idea that it's expected that there will be correction for things that are wrong, and that that correction should be applied. A child also has a sense of wanting to be seen as good. We as adults call this worship. I said that this is the way we should see and approach God. And that our struggles that we have with this come from life experiences. From those people around us in our lives that have reacted to negative situations and instead of acting from a sense of true justice and truth, 
they act from, react from anger or fear. Most of us, by the time we pass the age of two, are already starting to be jaded. And the awe, the worship, becomes far less. It definitely is no longer our go-to response. Instead, we're always looking for the other shoe to drop. Our worship is always tempered. This is just reality. But when we're told that we need to come to God in a state of awe, a state of worship, a state of fear, by the way, every one of those words are synonyms when it comes to God. Awe, worship, and fear. It's the only place you can make them a synonym. If you try to make fear a synonym with worship, any other place in the world, it doesn't apply. But when it comes to God, it applies. If we only see God as what we are told is the just God of the Old Testament, what often happens is we translate that just God of the Old Testament and we look at it through our lens and we call him a vengeful God. We assume it's out of anger or even a malicious intent that that's the reason things happen. We read verses like in Exodus chapter 32, verse 10. Now leave me alone, he said to Moses, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. We look at that and we say, see, God is a vengeful God, angry and abusive. But this is not a revenge God. It's a just God. You see, just 40 days before he said that, they had already heard him speak in his own voice all of the Israelite nation, telling them not to have any other gods or graven images except him. And here they are, worshiping a golden calf, and dancing and having a party around a great big bonfire. And God is saying to Moses, Dude, something's wrong. Not only that, but they were told if they did worship other gods and make gra graven images and worship them, God was going to destroy them. Forty days. So it's not any surprise that most of you, 40 minutes later, are already doing stupid stuff. Deuteronomy 8, 19-20 says this, If you ever forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods, and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed, like the nations the Lord destroyed before you. So you will be destroyed for not obeying Yahweh, your God. When God told Moses to leave him alone so his anger could burn, he was saying something completely different than how we translate anger burning. <clears throat> Honestly, if I heard you say that that you need your anger was burning inside of you I would be able to translate and assume that you wanted to work up your anger so you could take revenge for what you perceived as an assault to you or someone or thing that you deeply cared about right 
If I, I heard you say, my anger is burning, what you're saying is, I'm going to get revenge. Isn't that what you would be saying? So, when God says this to Moses, it's instantaneous that we think God is feeling injured because the cause he cares about is himself and then be, being obeyed at all costs. And so he, we think he's saying to Moses, I'm going to go work myself up to take revenge out of anger and I'm going to smite the people of Israel. But I want you to hear me. It's a much deeper thought than that. First things first. Every single place in Scripture that you ever look, it is absolutely clear that God's only concern, all He ever cares about, all He ever has emotions about, is you. His passion is only to have a relationship with you. So destroying you is not beneficial to his passion. When God says, leave me alone so my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, it's more like he's saying, I need to take a break for a minute. I need to rest. I need to take some deep breaths because something's wrong. I need to grieve because I don't have a choice. I got to end them. Now, you think I'm taking license with that, but that's the literal translation. He sees them worshiping this golden calf, and his heart breaks. Because they are doing exactly what he told them they couldn't do and told them what the consequence was going to be. And he says to Moses, I, I'm undone right now. You've got to get away from me. I need to grieve. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I am deep in grief, I'm taking some real extreme but deep breaths, which the word we translate anger translates to that process. Rest in deep press. My anger may burn against them. Because I need to grieve. And I need to grieve because I got to do something I don't want to. Now, think about this. Doesn't that make it make much more sense? Because Moses says, wait, God, hold on. You can't do that. Everybody in the world will see you as stupid if you do that. Remember I told you, go read Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm going to take licenses. <laughs> but the reality is, Moses, we think, convinces God to change his mind. God can't do that. No man can give God direction. But think about it. If God was grieving and Moses gave him a reasonable way to deal with the people that would allow him to have what he wanted and be just, wouldn't he take it? He doesn't want to lose the one thing that's most important to him. More than anything in the world, he wants you. He wanted them. And Moses says, hold on, God. If you do that, other people are going to see you as unable to do it. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I've got to punish them. There's got to be a, a consequence. But, 
I can wait a minute. Fear, awe, worship, when we understand it this way, it makes sense that we can put those three together. It gives us the ability to praise in every situation, doesn't it? So we read in Matthew about a man, a rich man, that came to Jesus and asked what he needed to do. He didn't come to Jesus in a position of awe. He didn't come to Jesus from a position of worship. He didn't even come to Jesus from a position of fear. He came in a position of guarded, selfish desire. But Jesus looked at him and loved him in spite of himself. Mark tells us the same story and in Mark 10.21 it says Jesus looked at him and loved him. He said one thing you lack go sell everything you have give it to the poor and you will have a treasure in heaven then come follow me. In spite of his lack of awe fear and worship in spite of your lack of fear awe and worship God loves us. When we approach, no matter how we approach Him, whether from a state of selfishness or self-righteousness, you know, our own determination of what is right for us, or from a place of humbleness, or from a place of self-loathing, it doesn't matter how we approach Him. He looks at us the same way. He loves us especially because we came to Him. Our desire, what we're looking for, is not nearly as important as what His desire is. So when the rich man came to Jesus and said, I want to be with you now and forever, you know, what do I have to do to get the kingdom life? Jesus rejoices and tells him, tells you, the next thing you have to do. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Your Bibles should be already open there. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves. I'm sorry, it's not there. I lied. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? The rich man had his whole world under control. So when Jesus gave him the call to take up his cross and follow him, that was just too hard. From his standpoint, I'm sure he probably thought Jesus would be mean and vengeful. He thought Jesus was saying being rich was a problem. How many of you thought that? Yet that is not what Scripture says anywhere. He didn't say being rich was a problem. Not at all. He just wanted the rich man and you and I to only focus on him. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, remember I told you I get, I'm giving you homework. Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses tells the people 
that if they just do what God asks, they will be very rich. If Moses tells the Jewish people that they will be very rich, if they just do what God says, being rich can't be a problem, can it? A little bit later, he also goes on to tell them that there will also always be poor people among them. It's not just a New Testament thing. And when he says there will always be poor among you, he also says those of you that have must, without reservation, give generously to the poor people. Being rich is not a problem. Jesus was saying to the rich man, you have to love God above all. You need to want to please Him because you see His greatness and His love. Isn't it interesting that we can look at the law of Moses and see the words of Jesus Christ to the rich man? The correlation that's there. Jesus told that rich man, you need to do the things that Moses already told you to do. As I was reading this yesterday, I realized that even the disciples were confused by this whole thing. They were on the Old Testament side of the cross. Matthew 19 23 through 30. You should have your Bible open to this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Hear this. Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, Good old Peter, We left everything to follow you. What are we going to get? <laughs> oh, wait, did I paraphrase that? Yeah, but it fit. <laughs> and that happens sometimes sometimes my brain just translates really fast Peter answered him we've left everything to follow you what then will there be for us Jesus said to them truly I tell you at the renewal of all things when the son of man sits on his glorious throne you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or fathers, or mothers, or wife, or children, or fields, I think you've pretty much covered everything, right? For my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. The disciples equated the salvation and the kingdom of God together at this point. They didn't understand that for the kingdom to come and them to live in it now, Jesus had to die and then be raised again. They were still living on the Old Testament side of the cross. And the church, even today, consistently teaches us to come to the cross
But they forget that salvation and the kingdom life is not at the cross. It's on the other side of the cross. Jesus tells us that we must take the cross and follow him to the hill. We must willingly lay down on it, let them drive nails in, suffer the same pain and humiliation of that death ourselves, and it's only after dying to our old self that we can be raised and a new creation, be a new creation in Christ. That's what Paul said. Jesus said, it's only then that we can be born again. Coming to the cross is no different than that rich man walking up to Jesus asking what do I need to do to live forever. We walk up to the cross and we want the outcome. But to get it, we must actually do what is necessary. So many people come with a plan, a desire of what it must look like. But they can't grasp the concept that the resurrected life must be different. They also can't grasp the concept that it comes with better promises. Hebrews 8. Not on here. Hebrews 8, verses 5 through 10 says this. They served at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. Talking about the Jews. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything in accordance to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. But in fact... The ministry Jesus has received is superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with what the first covenant with that first covenant no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault not with the covenant, but God found fault with the people and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. So many times we either, like the rich man, turn away from the cross, disappointed, or we come to the cross with a problem and we'll, we write it down on a sheet of paper and we nail it to the cross. And we're excited about its death. But our resurrection is only partial because only part of us died. How many of you ever been someplace where they had a cross and they had a whole bunch of nails and papers and they said, write your stuff down, fold it up, take it up to the cross and nail it to the cross? Fair warning, I'm going to destroy it for you right now. And trust me, I didn't like it when I came up with it either, when God showed it to me. It's an image that I want you to really think about. And I'm going to 
tell you again, you're probably never going to be able to nail something to a cross like that ever again. If you take that piece of paper, that struggle, and you take it to nail it to the cross of Jesus, you are literally going back to the day that Jesus was laying on that cross as they nailed him on it. And just before they take that cross and stand it up, you come running up and yell, Wait! I need to nail this to his body. Jesus needs us and wants us to not be walked to the hill. He wants us to take our cross, walk to the hill, lay it down, and tell them to nail us to it and be willing to die to self. So he can raise us new. See, salvation is coming to the cross. That's why the disciples were confused. They had not experienced the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection yet. But the kingdom life can only be after the cross. We have to accept God's counsel. We have to accept that it's correct and true. We have to accept that it only comes from His love and desire to live with you, to live in you, right now and forever. See, salvation starts at the coming to Jesus. Then you have to believe Him and do what He tells you to do to live the kingdom life. Almost all of my life, because that's what I was taught, years ago I went to the cross and I believed Him. And I was saved. But I was always taught that I had to take and write down my stuff and nail it to the cross. And nobody ever told me I was sticking it to Him. Today, I am way more aware of that cross. That resurrection. Right now, I am aware of it more than ever before. How about you? Are you ready to recognize the difference between salvation and actually dying to self? You know, the reality is, when it comes down to it, I can nail one thing at a time to that cross and I, it will die with Christ. And I'm inflicting even more wounds on him. And I can find freedom. And I can have a little small piece of kingdom life. Or I can actually do what Jesus said. I can take my cross. I can carry it up to that hill. I can lay down on it. Without a fight. And let them nail me to it. I can suffer the humiliation and the ridicule and the pain. Excruciating death. Which, by the way, is the only way to deal with anything in your life. Somebody's got to experience the pain. It's either going to be you or somebody else. Knowing that once I take that final breath of holding on to everything that I thought was important to me, I get to that point where Jesus said, and I give me a second, 
in Matthew 16. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? He told the disciples in Matthew 19, You give up. All those things. I'm trying to find it. I'm sorry. If you give up house, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, wife, children, fields, for my sake, you will receive a hundred times more. If you're willing to give up your life, everything about it, die, you'll receive so much more. It comes with such a greater promise. be honest, I struggle with the greater promise, the hundred times more, because it's in there and then I start selfishly chasing the hundred times more instead of recognizing that I needed to come because of how great he is. He said, come with me. Do it with me. And when he raises me from the dead, I get to be born again. I get to be a new creation. I get to renew my mind. Unfortunately for you and I, we're still living in this broken flesh shell with the evil of the devil reminding us of what we used to be. But there is combat for that. And we're learning about that together. So I'm going to ask you today. The altar is going to be open. We're going to have a time where we can really think about this. Are you going to continue to take each small piece, write it on a piece of paper, go back to the day Jesus was nailed to that cross, and just before he gets lifted up in the air, say, wait, I need to nail this to him. Or is it time to take your cross to the hill and let them nail you to it? Jesus loves you so much that he doesn't care how you came to him. He's just asking you to do the things he's always asked of everyone. Follow him to the hill and die. Don't worry about what it looks like after that. Just trust Him. Because the next answer will be there. I promise. If we can do that, we can live the kingdom life right now and forever. Father God, I praise You and I thank You for everything You're doing in our lives. And I ask You that today, You do the work in these people, Lord. These were Your words, not mine. And it's time. It's time for change. There is no point in anything else if we don't do this next step. Because all we're doing is inflicting more wounds on you. And that is shameful. And that's another prayer phrase, Lord, of what Paul had to say about that whole process. Lord, today, break our hearts. And let us see how important it is to just do what you've always asked. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Don't let us walk away. Lord, impress on us the need to step forward. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. There will be worship and the altar will be open.